Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking about Afghanistan, and our guest, a returning guest to Talk World Radio, is Matthew Ho. Matt Ho is a senior fellow with the Center for International Policy and a member of the Eisenhower Media Network, EMN. He's also on the advisory board of World Beyond War, where we need as much of his advising as we can get. He is a 100% disabled Marine combat veteran, and in 2009, he resigned his position with the State Department in Afghanistan in protest of the escalation of that war. Matthew Ho, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Hi, David. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Uh, what's what's happening in Afghanistan? What are we being told is happening, and and what is happening in Afghanistan? Well, um, going back about uh, uh, nearly three years now, um, in the fall of 2018, the Trump administration, after escalating the war in Afghanistan, so very similar to what Richard Nixon did with Vietnam, right? Uh, increases the bombing and then goes to the uh, peace table and gets the same deal with the Vietnamese that we could have had years before, basically. Uh, it, so more or less the same thing's occurring in Afghanistan. Fall of 18, uh, Trump tells Zalmay Khalilzad to go uh, and talk with the Taliban. The Taliban agree to talk with him right away, which shows that the Taliban have always been willing to talk. It's always just been an American insistence on victory in Afghanistan, on winning, um, as opposed to bringing about any peace there. Uh, and within um, a year, a, a peace deal uh, is, uh, is brought about. It's by far, it's, 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 it's very flawed. It's the first step in a peace process, so it's only between the U.S. and the, and the Taliban. The second part of that was to be the Taliban and the Afghan government working on uh, uh, next steps, including a ceasefire. Um, and over, it, it takes six months for the agreement to be signed, uh, partly because Donald Trump throws a temper tantrum. Um, but the agreement is signed in February of 2020. And in that agreement, um, US, for, US and foreign forces are supposed to leave Afghanistan by uh, May 1st, 2021. And so uh, Joe Biden uh, recently um, announced that he would not be meeting that date for the remaining 3,500 U.S. troops, acknowledged U.S. troops in Afghanistan to leave Afghanistan, but rather that mil the U.S. military would begin leaving on May 1st and that withdrawal would be complete by uh, September 11th, 2021, uh, of course, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 attacks. Uh, this has been met by the Taliban with, uh, with uh, annoyance, uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, is a polite way to put it. Uh, they have already said that, look, we're not going to, you know, you're violating the agreement. We had a deal and you're breaking it. Um, we are not going to participate in any more talks about the future of Afghanistan, including this upcoming conference in Istanbul, um, until foreign forces leave, as has been agreed upon. And they've also made threats saying that the U.S. will pay the consequences of the U.S. breaking the deal. So uh, it's very precarious because, of course, what happens if the Taliban do begin to kill Americans again? What happens if, say, the Taliban shoot down an American helicopter, kill eight, nine, ten Americans, what will Joe Biden do? What kind of political pressure will he have? So there is, uh, you know, again, going back to Vietnam, there is this notion to me of this decent interval, right, where uh, there are now four or five months where anything can happen. There can be all kinds of reasons and context to uh, abrogate the withdrawal, to break the peace process, for the peace process to fall apart. There is reason for people on all sides of the conflict, uh, Americans, Taliban, as well as especially those in the Afghan government, to want to see the peace process fall apart and the war continue. I mean, there's, you know, we, we can go into all the different reasons for that, but I don't think it's hard for people to understand why there are people who want this, this peace process to fail. So it's a very precarious uh, situation. And this is, is quite, um, 
this is quite necessary for the Afghan people. The Afghan war has been going on for more than 40 years. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it starts in 1978, really. Uh, by the time the Soviet Union invades in 1979, there are 100,000 Afghan dead. Uh, of course, it's important to mention that the United States starts funding the uh, militant groups, the anti-government groups, the mili uh, 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 Islamist militant groups uh, in Afghanistan for six months prior to the Soviet Union's invasion, um, the idea being by Zygmunt Brzezinski, who was Jimmy Carter's uh, national security advisor, that we were gonna, the United States was going to bait the Soviet Union into a trap and that we were going to give the Soviet Union their own Vietnam. And here we are, well more than 40 years later, uh, dealing with the consequences of uh, that uh, mania, uh, basically. Uh, so it's important because th this is the first formal peace process in Afghanistan in over 30 years. So this is a really necessary thing for the Afghan people. So uh, again, it's quite precarious, but uh, it potentially could be a good thing if things don't fall apart. Matt Ho, when I saw this announcement from Biden that the troops would be out by September 11th, uh, first I thought, oh, God, glorifying September 11th. <laughs> then I thought, it's like ending World War I at 11 o'clock. If you can pick a random time to That's end right. the thing, then how is it absolutely critically necessary last resort up until that random time? And then I thought, if you're pulling out, you know, I know it's at least 3,500, not counting this and that and the other, but they claim yeah. 2,500. If you were pulling out 2,500 from May 1st to September 11th, that would be 18 guys a day. They must be you know, <laughs> withdrawing by minivan, right? And so, I mean, <laughs> does anybody take this stuff seriously? Does it make the United States look credible or slimy in the eyes of the world? Well, this is what's really concerning to me is that, um, you know, as you say, 18 guys a day, you, either you're picking a date, why can't you do it? I mean, you're talking about 3,500 acknowledged. And this is another important thing to address, right? This does not include the thousands of special operations and CIA personnel that will remain in Afghanistan or around Afghanistan. It will not include the um, the the literally dozens of attack aircraft and drone squadrons that are in and around the Middle East, uh, South and Central Asia, in the Indian Ocean, in the Red Sea, you know, in the Mediterranean, et cetera, et cetera, as well as, too, the, the dozens of ships that have, of U.S. Uh, Navy ships that have hundreds of cruise missiles uh, that can strike Afghanistan. So the idea that the United States is militarily withdrawing from this conflict is just, you know, completely false. Uh, and with, you know, but even the 3,500 acknowledged troops, yeah, that's what, maybe 15, 20, 747s worth of, 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 of trips, you know? I mean, the, 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 what concerns me, though, David, is this, is that um, I believe it was in March that, uh, or maybe it was early April, that Joe Biden said uh, we cannot meet the May 1st deadline for withdrawal from Afghanistan because of tactical reasons and logistical reasons. And hardly anyone questioned him on that. I don't think anyone really did. And it's all nonsense. I mean, as someone who used to do this kind of thing, who took part in both wars, the idea that you can't get 3,500 troops out is just, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's BS. It, it's, it's, it's a lie. Um, the concerning thing for me is, did the military openly defy President Biden with this? Uh, did the military say we're not going to do this? We've seen that the military has done this with P Donald Trump in terms of lying with how many troops they had in, in Syria or in Iraq uh, with outright, you know, uh, anyone who's been part of an institution, uh, particularly, say, a trillion dollar institution like the U.S. military with millions of personnel and knows that there is uh, it's a living organism as well as to that institutionally, the inst it knows, the institution knows that it can always outlast whatever person is trying to make a decision. Um, but there's a really, for me, it's a very real concern that the U.S. military say, no, we're not going to do this. I mean, look, the military knew for 14 months about this May 1st deadline. And now they're saying for tactical reasons, we can't get out by May 1st. I mean, so there was clearly a desire, a, a, a a refusal by the U.S. military to accept it as well as to address it and plan for it. And then did they openly say to, to Joe Biden, we're not going to do this and then agree 
Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of, uh, you know, if you look at CNN or any of the reporting uh, coming out about this withdrawal, all these uh, uh, anonymous officials, of course, uh, saying how Joe Biden overruled the Pentagon on this withdrawal and how, you know, and of course, now you're seeing all of the, the uh, anonymous threats uh, and foreshadowing coming from uh, the, the, the Pentagon, as well as Langley and, and Foggy Bottom, uh, that, um, uh, you know, the dangers of this withdrawal, the reckless nature of this withdrawal, how, or how Joe Biden is uh, uh, dishonoring the sacrifice of thousands of brave young Americans who gave their lives for freedom and democracy and, you know, whatever other propaganda they want to spill. So, you know, that's a real concern for me. It's like, hey, did the Pentagon, did, did they refuse to do this? Um, and is this four-month uh, deal uh, to draw the troops out exactly that, a compromise with many in the Pentagon hoping that it gets spoiled and that the process, peace process falls apart over the next several months. Am, am I right, Matt Ho, that the top source of death among participants and past participants from the U.S. side in this particular war has been suicide? So that what we're actually talking about is that people should not have killed themselves in vain uh, and you should yes. send more people into this for that reason? Yes, the... Um... The leading cause of suicide, the leading cause of death for Iraq and Afghan veterans, as well as uh, we don't have really have the numbers for Vietnam because they weren't keeping track of them. But it, it's it's assumed that the number of uh, uh, and, and then most likely too, it's it's very possible that the same applies to Korea, World War Two. We know that after the Civil War, hundreds of thousands of Civil War veterans died. Uh, by suicide, from alcoholism, from opiate overdose, from exposure because they were homeless, hundreds of thousands. I mean, it's very clear that that's what happened after the Civil War. Um, right now, the, the number of Iraq and Afghan veterans who die by suicide every day is close to two. Uh, so it's very easy to say two because, as most people know, suicide is uh, often undercounted, right? If, if you have a... Uh, if somebody slams their car into a bridge abutment, if someone overdoses, how do you know if that's suicide or an accident? Um, so two is, is a pretty conservative estimate probably. But just by doing the math, two times 365 gives you more dead from suicide every year than only two or three of the years uh, of combat in Iraq. Um, so, you know, and then you, you multiply that times almost 20 now, and you clearly see that there have been, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there have been, uh, you know, you're getting well over 10,000 suicides, maybe close to 15,000 suicides of Iraq and Afghan veterans when you have about 7,000 uh, Americans who were killed in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. So yeah. you're talking about potentially double the number. Um, and the thing about it, David, of course, is that that number never ends. These men and women will continue to kill themselves f f as long as that generation is alive. We know this because World War II veterans are killing themselves at, at rates much higher than their civilian peers. Uh, World War II veterans are killing them, kill themselves at a rate four times higher than men their own age who did not go to war in World War II, four times. Um, and, you know, this still applies to these men who are now in there, and some women, um, but mostly men who are now in their 80s and 90s. Um, and then one, one more thing I want to make sure people, uh, uh, we, we talk about with the deaths that from on the American side for these wars, that doesn't include the contractor deaths. And Brown University, the Cost of War Project at the Watson Institute up there, they do such great work. Uh, they've gone through, you know, a lot of data, Department of Labor data, Department of Defense data, and they have found that there have been an equivalent number of contractor deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan as military deaths. So when you say that there have been 7,000 Americans killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, well, you really have to double that because there's been an equal number of contractors killed as well. Um, so, uh, you know, you're looking at when you say that, there have been 7,000 combat deaths. Well, really, there's been about 14,000 combat deaths. And then, say, there have been an equivalent number of, uh, at this point now, equivalent number of suicides. So, say, 14,000 suicides. Um, you know, you're talking about a war that's killed about 30,000 Americans. And not even talking about, of course, by the number of Iraqis, Afghans, 
you know, um, as well, well as all the other places. It doesn't places. scratch the surface of the Iraqis no. and Afghans, but it does outpace the drone victims, the police shooting victims, the mass yes. shooting victims, many hot topics in the news. It it dwarfs. So uh, it's, it's quite significant. We're speaking with Matthew Ho, who is a senior fellow with the Center for International Policy and a member of the Eisenhower Media Network. Matt, let's talk about some of the, the arguments to stay. Uh, you know, we must be as careful getting out as we were reckless getting in, and it's, you know, <laughs> we, we have a responsibility. We've, we've busted into your house, raped your family, and smashed your furniture, but we have a responsibility, a moral duty to stay and never leave. Can you, can you speak to these arguments? Because they're all over the media. Yeah, I, I laugh, you know, because um, I think that's all you can do at this point in some ways, right? Um, and I'm always reminded of Socrates said, um, excuse me, uh, and I'll paraphrase, so I won't get it right, but the uh, the tragic and the comic are as inseparable as light and shadow, you know? Um, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, the, the arguments, and it's it's amazing, right, how quickly the arguments came out. Not amazing. We know how the system works. We know how the machine works. We know that the, the relationship between the Pentagon and the media and, and you know, um, but it just still is amazing that as soon as, as Biden uh, says this, uh, there are full columns, full editorials in all the major newspapers. Uh, the experts, of course, are on CNN and MSNBC and Fox and everything. And, um, you know, they're getting booked on NPR. Uh, the, and you see that the, the, the talking points are often quite the same. It's, 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 it's you know, obviously uh, has been workshopped by PR firms. Uh, but, you know, it, it is, it's, it's this idea that somehow, it, 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 I don't know how journalists do it because this is a war that, again, has been going on since 1978. You know, the United States has had military on the ground since 2001, so almost 20 years, and journalists still will write with a straight face about a precipitous U.S. withdrawal. I, I just don't understand how they can do that, you know? Um, uh, so, but they do. And the idea that it's precipitous is just absolutely nuts. The idea that somehow... Um, this is reckless is also absolutely crazy. Uh, the, the, the how counterproductive these wars have been. I mean, just step away from the, the aspects of how this has been immoral and tragic and the suffering that's been inflicted on people and everything and the, the profiteering from it. We step away from that and just, just as if we were just, uh, you know, these geopolitical realists who look at this like it's a game of risk, right? You know, which is how some people actually do unfortunately, but that's, um, it, it's been so counterproductive. And there's two uh, data points I use to, to, to help illustrate this. Uh, one is that in 2001, the U.S. State Department, um, so the U.S. government uh, cited that there were four, a total of four international terror groups in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And now uh, the reports, uh, the U.S. government reports, there are more than 20 international terror groups in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So you've had a five-fold increase in terror groups, right, over the last 20 years in Afghanistan and Pakistan. The other point is, of course, al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda in 2001, according to the U.S. government, was 400 people total worldwide. That's it. That's how big they were. And certainly look back over the last 20 years, and you have seen that they have grown to have branches and affiliates in dozens of countries, tens of thousands of members, they have conquered and controlled entire cities and regions. So to go from a 400 person, uh, I don't know what you call that, outfit, you know, I mean, is that even a, an organization at that point in terms of, right, in terms of international uh, standards? Uh, but what they grew into, though, because of the United States' actions, the United States' response to 9-11, uh, it's very clear. And this isn't just the case for Afghanistan. Um, in the year that the United States stands up Africa Command in Africa, there are reported, there are less than 300 terror attacks reported in Africa in 2008. In 2018, so 10 years after Africa, Africa Command has been established, and now the U.S. has troops and commandos and drones in more than 20 countries in Africa, there are more than 3,000 terror attacks in Africa. 
So you see terror attacks grow by a, a factor of more than 10 in Africa after Africa Command starts operating in Africa. So the, the, the fact that has just how counterproductive this has all been is so easy to see. It, 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 it's it, it, all this information that comes from the U.S. government itself. You know, I mean, it just, it's just it's 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 a me it's um, it's startling how counterproductive it really is. Uh, you know, and then you hear these other uh, uh, these other arguments, too, about uh, if we pull out of Afghanistan, it will be the same mistake that Barack Obama made pulling the troops out of, of Iraq at late in late 2011 and the Islamic State will come back and take over, et cetera, et cetera. And that ignores the reality of what happened in Syria and Iraq. What happened in Syria and Iraq is that, yes, the Islamic State did capture Mosul in, in large parts of Iraq in 2014, but that was not because the United States didn't have troops there anymore. That's because the United States and its allies, the Saudis, the Qataris, the Turks, had have been supporting the Islamic State in Syria, and we know this through leaked U.S. intelligence documents, as well as the statements of people like Barack Obama and Joe Biden and John Kerry themselves have said this, uh, that the United States was, was and its allies were supporting the Islamic State in Syria with the idea that the United States could use the Islamic State to overthrow the Assad government in Syria, but that somehow we could control the Islamic State and the Islamic State, which comes from Al Qaeda in Iraq, so most of the Islamic State leadership and many of its members were Iraqis themselves, would not go east, cross the literal line in the sand, and take the war back into Iraq. This was the hubris and the idiocy of the Obama administration, which is, you know, has been, I don't want to single the Obama administration out because certainly you can uh, point to any other administration that has done these kinds of things. So the idea that somehow that the same will occur in Afghanistan is just, um, is just wrong. I mean, the reason why it occurred in Iraq was because we were, we were supporting the Islamic State in Syria not because we pulled troops out. It's the same reason why the Taliban took control of Afghanistan in the first place, because we were supporting their predecessors for 13 or 14 years in Afghanistan. We, we kept supporting these Mujahideen groups, these very groups that turned into the Taliban. We kept supporting them for three years after the Soviet Union left. And as we spoke before, we were supporting them before the Soviet Union invaded. So these are all Frankenstein's monsters that the United States has created ourselves. Uh, you know, and then finally, the last one I want to address, because it's probably my favorite of the fear mongering, because it comes with a photo, is that of Saigon 1975. And usually there's the photo of the helicopter departing from the U.S. Embassy in Saigon in 1975 as the North Vietnamese are, are taking Saigon um, and uh, U.S. Embassy is evacuating. And that's the, the image that people want to use for Kabul. And I don't think that's the case. Excuse me. I don't think that's the case because we, the Taliban saw what happened when um, the Islamic State took Mosul in 2014. Three years later, Mosul was completely destroyed, completely flattened. The same happened with Raqqa. The same happened with Aleppo. Um, these cities that have been seized by these types of groups have been completely destroyed by foreign air forces. And I believe that would be the same case. And I believe the Taliban know that. They understand that. They do not want that. Um, they want power, of course, but they're not suicidal. And they've already been removed from power by U.S. air power once before. You know, so that's not they, – these are men, um, and they're all, it's all men in the Taliban leadership, um, who, are, who are victors of 40 years of war. They are smart. They are careful. They are considerate. The idea that they want to just jump right into a situation that's going to allow the United States to send B-52s back over Kabul just doesn't make any sense. So, yes, they want to take power. They want to seize power. But, however, and I've met, I've met these, these men. I, I've met their interlocutors, and I've met some of them myself. They uh, are tired of fighting. They are tired of fighting. They, 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 and they're not going to surrender, but they are tired of fighting. And you have to give them a chance 
you have to give it an option other than victory or surrender. And unfortunately, that's what the United States has been doing for so long. It's like, here are your two choices, Taliban, victory or surrender. Not that the Taliban are a good option for the Afghan people. Of course not. They're hideous. However, you know, this is the worst thing possible for the, the, the Afghan people, because for the Afghan people, what the United States has been saying is like, hey, look, you, you get whoever wins this war, the terrible Taliban or the terrible Afghan government with its, you know, U.S. backers. That's, those are the two things we're offering you, you know. So the idea that there has to be negotiations provide some type of alternative as well as a ceasefire and then to the killing that would at least provide some chance for peace. Um, you, you know, after all these years, how could anyone oppose that if they're not somehow uh, profiting from this war, whether it be whether for because of career reasons, legacy reasons, money reasons, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, Matt Ho, we've got just a few minutes left. Uh, you know who's not tired of war seems to be the New York Times, the Washington Post, <laughs> numerous members of Congress, quite a few guys in, in air-conditioned offices in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to me that if the Congress members who speak out against these wars in Afghanistan and Yemen, as some of them do, uh, actually would forbid the wars. Uh, you know, we, we had both houses twice in the last Congress when they could count on a veto vote to end the war on Yemen. Now the president is of a different political party, not a sign out of Congress. Uh, you have Congress members saying end the war on Afghanistan, cheering for this supposed ending of the war on Afghanistan. But if the New York Times is openly trumpeting that the air war will continue, the special, they're so special, the forces will, the, the so-called intelligence, so-called community will continue. Why, why would Congress members pretend that the war is ending uh, and not uh, simply do their duty and end it? Uh, wouldn't, the, wouldn't the president appreciate them and pat them on the back for helping him out if he's actually ending it? What's the problem? Yeah, right. And let alone uh, that they be following their obligations and responsibilities to the Constitution for being responsible for war, right? I mean, it, it, I saw this actually, David, you know, when I was working on Afghanistan stuff, uh, when I first started, you have been involved in this for a long, long time before I did, but I really saw this in 2009, 2010 where um, the Obama administration really had a stranglehold on the House and the Senate in terms of limiting their protests against the Afghan war. And then as the Obama surge ended and Obama wanted to bring the troops home, that grip opened back up and more members were allowed to voice their opinion about Afghanistan. It's quite remarkable. I remember meeting Michael Steele one time um, Michael Steele was the former Republican. I've actually, actually met him a bunch of times, but he was the former Republican National Committee chair. Um, and people may remember him because he was always putting his mouth, his foot in his mouth. And, and uh, but he said to me, met. okay, he said to me, he said the, the biggest, um, uh, the, he, he, and he had just made a statement about how the Afghan war was stupid. And he said he'd never gotten such pushback from member from Republican members of Congress. He said literally dozens of House members and many Senate Republican members called him and said, yes, you are right, but you cannot say that. Yeah, it's Isn't a that problem. Yeah. We got to yeah. deal with it. Thank you for saying it. Matthew Ho, he is a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy and a member of the Eisenhower Media Network. Matt, thanks again for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.